thank you. Tell us about extended formulation. Thank you very much. So, and uh, yeah, so what I would like to do today is to give you an overview of. Uh, extended formulations and what this really comes down to is to understand what you can model with linear programs and semi-definite programs of say polynomial size and we will make all these things uh, a bit more precise as we go. So if there's one thing that you want to take from this talk today and you only want to remember one thing I think it's really nicely encoded in this slide here. So let's look at the picture. What you have here is you have a polytope in two-dimensional space, right? This is like this regular eight gone down here and you need eight inequalities to denote this n gone in two-dimensional space. However, if I'm permitting myself to write this thing in slightly higher dimensional space, namely three-dimensional space, like how I did with this Q here, I can write this Q with only six uh, inequalities. So by permitting myself to write something in slightly higher dimensional space, I can save a significant number of inequality, right? Like in this case, it, it's two. And uh, in fact, you can generalize this to the two to the n gone, the regular two to the n gone, and then you would see you would only need a linear number of inequalities to write a two to the n dimensional, two dimensional object, okay? And that's, that's the idea here, so that if you write something in higher dimensional space, how much resources can you save in terms of writing down your linear programming formulation or your geometric object? Uh, if you, let's say, allow yourself uh, using a polynomial, ni a t polynomial number of extra dimensions, okay? And um, the, the key question now is can you somehow invert that process? And what I mean by this is if I give you a, a polytope or a, a linear program in original space, can you somehow give me a way of constructing these extra dimensions to represent this object in higher dimensional space in the most optimal way? Or the other way around, that is what I'm more interested in is, can you convince me that in all possible ways of you rewriting this linear program in higher dimensional space, you will not be able to significantly save the number of required resources? Okay, so what this comes down to is something like uh, which you could call the inherent complexity of denoting a linear program or equivalently a semi-definite program if you slightly adapt uh, the notation. And, and if you want to have this in a slightly philosophically way, what this comes down is you want to like compress polytopes and find the optimal way of denoting a polytope. Okay, so that's really what extended formulations is about. You want to invert this, this uh, projection operation here in the hope that if you permit yourself writing things with an exponential uh, existential quantifier, then you can save uh, significant resources, or you want to rule out that you cannot do this. All right, so this phenomenon itself is, is actually uh, uh, well known, but not really well understood. Like everywhere where you look where you have quantifier elimination, you see the same thing. You eliminate existential quantifiers. That means that typically your description of whatever you have is going to blow up. In some metaphysical way, you can even think of P versus NP to be a question about quantifier elimination, because you have an element being in your language, even only if there exists a small certificate that certifies in polynomial time that the element is in the language, right? That's how we define uh, NP. And then you can ask yourself, what happens now if I project out this existential quantifier here? Do I still maintain a good characterization of my language? So in, the same, in, in this sense, it's a very similar type of question. And we know, at least for linear programs, a procedure that uh, allows us to eliminate existential quantifiers or variables, that's Fourier-Motzkin elimination. And that typically leads to an exponential blow up when you do this because you combine positive and negative coefficients together. And then you get an exponential blow up if you want to eliminate a linear number of variables. So that we know. Um, so in a, in a nutshell, what this really comes down to is that if you think about extended formulations, the way of how you want to think about this is you want to inverse or reverse this quantifier elimination process in the hope that you can find a more compact or better description by using existential quantifiers, which is nothing else but having a couple of extra dimensions in higher dimensional space. Okay? And uh, if you think about this for like five minutes, um, there's a couple of very natural questions uh, that arise from this. So one very natural question is that if you now um, give me any 0, 1 polytope, and the 0, 1 polytope is nothing else but the convex hull of, say, the incidence vectors of combinatorial objects, could it be that every one of these 0, 1 polytopes has actually a polynomial size extended formulation? Now, if you think about this for two seconds, you will first say that makes no sense at all because as long as you assume that, uh, that NP is unequal to P, this should not be possible. However, the key thing here is we only talk about the number of inequalities, not about the encoding lens. So in principle, it could be possible 
that you trade encoding lengths for the number of inequalities, allowing you to write the object in a small, like high dimensional space, but with crazy encoding lengths for your coefficients. You don't know a priori. The second question that you can ask, is it possible that there exists a problem that you can solve in polynomial time, however that does not admit a small linear programming formulation? Why do you care? Because if you have a small linear programming formulation, you can solve that linear program in polynomial time, and you want to somehow know whether linear programming is a universal algorithm for everything that is in P. And if you find such a problem, you obviously have shown that linear programming is not universal. And last but not least, once you're done with linear programs, you can ask whether there is a meaningful separation between what you can write down with an STP and what you can write down with a linear program. Right? You know for certain other counts that it makes no difference. For example, for the second order count, like doing linear programming or second order count programming up to an epsilon error is the same thing, but maybe for STPs it's different. And uh, last but not least, you can also ask the question the other way around. Do there exist small linear programming formulations, say of polynomial size, for problems that are not in polynomial time or not polynomial time solvable? That question seems a bit weird in the beginning, but we will get to this question. Actually, it makes a lot of sense. And actually, there are examples where you can write a problem, like there's MP hard actually, with a small linear programming formulation. We have to resolve this uh, contradiction a bit later. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. No. So so um, so you have to be very careful. This is the value on result that you refer to, right? You have to be very careful there because um, so the way of how it's defined is for defini um, for decision problems, and it's a it's a, a non-uniform model in some sense. So it's here we typically want a polytope, and we want to be able to optimize any objective function over that polytope. That is like what we call uniform, because you don't know ahead of time what you want to decide, versus in the valiant model, you need to know ahead of time what the decision problem is, in some sense. So there is a, there's a significant difference that uh, does not imply that once you show that a, like an NP-hard problem has exponential size, that P is unequal to NP. So that you cannot derive, obviously. The question is what's the formulation? Yes, we get, exactly. Exactly. We get there in about five minutes. Okay? So, uh, about the first question, so just by counting up, you don't uh, get anything? Oh, you do. Uh, that is actually how you rule this out. So, that is exactly how it was done. Uh, but the key thing is you have to be very, very careful how you discretize your numbers now. Because I don't tell you anything about the encoding lens. And now you have to come up with something. You have to use the magnitude. You have absolute magnitude numbers because now it comes from a combinatory problem. And now this absolute magnitude, you have to translate back into encoding lens and doing some rounding. But you can do the rounding in a smart way such that the membership <coughs> problem is untouched. So everything that was in the polytope, as your one solution stays inside. And everything that is outside stays outside. But that's exactly how it's done. You do it like it's by the Shannon argument for the, for the Boolean functions. I, I, get, I come back to this later. Mm -hmm. so the second question, is there any complexity class for which there is a reason to believe that it admits low formulation? Uh, AC0, whatever. It's a good question. So I had a student of mine working exactly on the AC0 type of question, so it's unclear. And, and the reason, we come back to this later when we look at question four, is because linear programming is much more like, a, like, a, like circuit complexity, because you can use advice and things like this versus more like a computational class like P. We come back to this later. Okay, so there, we, we, don't, we don't know of anything. So you will be very surprised that you can solve some problems uh, with a small linear programming formulation, although they are NP-hard. And that only works, yeah, I'll, be, I'll get back to this later. All right, so maybe let's start a bit with motivation where this whole theory comes from. So it all started with a claim by Swart in 86 and 87, and he claimed that he could prove that P is equal to NP. And the way of how he wanted to do this is he wanted to give a polynomial size linear programming formulation for the TSP problem. Okay, and then by knowing that you can solve linear programming polynomial time, you would be done. And um, so the way of how this went, and uh, actually I was in Columbia yesterday and I talked to Yanakakis, and he, he, he gave me the full rundown of the story. So the way of how this went is people, people actually like, so Swart proposed an LP, people looked at the LP and they find a fractional solution so it was not integral, so it did not describe the TSP problem. 
Then he said, oh my bad, I forgot a couple of extra variables and a couple of extra constraints. Let me throw them in there. And it became more complex. People looked at it again, again found that it's the wrong linear program. And then he added more variables, more constraints, up to a point where nobody was able to prove that this linear program is not correct anymore, right? And what do you do? So that's when Yanakakis proved a very beautiful result, namely, whenever you have a linear program that is symmetric, and symmetric means that if you permute around the cities of your TSP problem, the LP remains the same. Then, the t the, any of these LPs has to have exponential size. And in the case of Swart, it was nice. All his LPs that he uh, proposed were of the symmetric nature, so it ruled out that any of these LPs could give the right answer. And that closed this chapter of Swart trying to prove that P is equal to NP by means of a small uh, TSP type of formulation. Now you could think that this ends the story, but in fact it actually started the story. So people tried for quite a long time to remove the symmetry assumption here. Uh, because everybody said ah, somehow the symmetry should not make a big difference, uh, let's try to remove it. People failed to remove it and at some point they gave up, but they believed it should not make a big difference. And that was for a very, very long time the state of, the, of mind, let's say, of people looking at these type of problems. And then there was a very nice paper in 2010 by Kyril Pashkovich and Tice, and that showed that symmetry can actually make a huge difference. And what they looked at, they didn't look at any type of artificial problems. They looked at the so-called L-matching problem, where you look for matchings of size L, which is very much related to Yanakaka's original proof, who looked at the matching polytope itself. And they showed that if you look at the L-matching problem for L being roughly of the order of log N, then there is a small asymmetric extended formulation of, let's say, polynomial size. But every symmetric extended formulation has to be of super polynomial size. So there is, a, there is actually a, a, a very well-defined separation between these two types of problems and later we found many, many more. But as you can imagine, that of course raised a lot of questions then. Is it maybe possible that if you remove the asymmetry assumption, you can find a small extended formulation? And um, remember, we are in 2010, so by this time we did not know whether you can trade size of linear programs against the encoding lens. So maybe you can just encode everything in the coefficients and you need only one inequality or something like this. We didn't know. And uh, that, that steered quite some interest. And then uh, Yanakakis wrote a very nice overview paper in 2011 and he reiterated, well, even if you remove the symmetry assumption, still for every NP-hard problem, you should not be able to find small linear programming formulations just by you know, the, way, the state of the world because the coefficients shouldn't make such a big difference. And um, then it took like about like a couple of months uh, later, and then Rothfuss proved uh, the, the first somewhat uh, lower bound result. It's a, it's an, uh, it's a lower bound, but it's a, an existential result. It's by counting. And he showed that there exist zero one polytopes that require an exponential number of inequalities in any linear programming formulation. And it actually worked exactly as you said by counting. And in fact, if you think about this and how these counting argu arguments work, it actually says something much stronger. It says that almost all polytope, with high probability, if you sample a zero one polytope, this one will require an exponential number of inequalities. It's just that if I give you one, you have no idea of knowing which you, whether you sampled the right one or not, right? So that was in 2011, and then about a year later, we were able to show that for the TSP polytope, you can remove the symmetry assumption, and there's no small linear programming formulation for the TSP polytope whatsoever. And uh, yeah, so that, that is, that, that's what really started this, what I would say, the more modern view on linear programming formulation and the underlying theory. And why do people care? Well, people care for many different reasons. I particularly care because it's a notion of complexity that is independent of P versus NP. You literally just count the number of resources that you need to write down your linear program. And you could argue it gives strong indications of P versus NP or not. But that's a more philosophical question here, and I don't want to get into this. All right, so that, that was the state of the art. Now let me tell you a bit of how you typically proved lower bounds for extended formulation, and then I give you a slightly more uh, cleaned up abstract model, which is much more useful if you want to do like more CS type of reasoning over these problems. So how, does the, how does the, did the initial approach work? So you start with some combinatorial optimization problem. You take this combinatorial optimization problem, you turn it into a linear program, let's say AX less than or equal to B. And then you try to find these extra variables here in higher dimensional space such that you can augment your linear system and hopefully the system only uses a small number of, uh, of new variables because this became non-equation system so it doesn't really matter anymore, okay? 
So that was the idea. And then if you like to think about lower bounds, you would now like to devise some mechanism that says, well, whenever you try to do this type of operation here, there exists a good reason why you should need at least an exponential number of inequalities. Okay, so that's typically how the argument works. You start from a combinatorial problem, you look at a linear program, you try to write this in high dimensional space, and then you convince people that you cannot do this with fewer than two to the whatever, theta n extra variables. Okay, so that's the typical roadmap. Um, so how do you do this? Um, well, you need a special matrix for this. That's the so-called slack matrix. Uh, it has a very simple definition. Um, it's, it's given here, but the idea, let me give you the idea. You look at all the facets of your defining polytope. So these are the facets, say. And you look at all the vertices here, 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 and here. And what you do now is you measure the algebraic distance between your vertex j, like vj, and the hyperplane aix being equal to bi. And that's the distance that you denote in the entry sij. And what it measures is really the distance of that vertex to that hyperplane. Why do you care for this? Well, you care for this because Yanakakis proved a very nice theorem in 88, which says that whenever I give you any polytope and you define any of its slack matrices, and a polytope can have many of these matrices because the system doesn't have to be unique and so on and so forth, any of these slack matrices, then the smallest linear program or lifting that you can compute is equal to the non-negative rank of the matrix. Okay? So that means if you want to say anything about the smallest size here, you have to say something about the non-negative matrix factorization of this matrix S. And vice versa, if you can say something about this guy, you can say something about the factorization. So these two things are literally the same thing. And uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's uh, why you care for this matrix. And uh, if you look at this model, and uh, there were a couple of people that were not very happy with the initial TSP proof. These were the ones that tried that P is equal to NP using the TSP. Uh, there was something that I called potential criticism. And they argued, well, maybe the issue is that you just showed that for the standard TSP polytope, so the standard PS TSP polytope, you ruled out that there is no small linear program formulation. But maybe I have a different TSP polytope that looks very different from yours, obviously. And for this one, there can exist a small linear program formulation. So the criticism was regarding whether this is dependent on the initial encoding that you pick, right? So I have a combinatorial problem, and I pick initial encoding here as a linear system AX less than or equal to B. And the question is, does the lower bound depend on this specific encoding or not? Okay, and that was the potential criticism. It's like, yeah, great, you proved the lower bound for the standard TSP polytope. I have a different TSP polytope, which is much better than yours, and for this one, I can give a small formulation. Right, and you couldn't argue that the bounds hold there as well. And that was what I call the classical model. We will now, I will give you a slightly more abstract model that rules out all these representation theoretic issues here. Uh, and um, that's what's, what I'm going to do now. I'm going to talk about LPs only here, but everything that I say you can immediately apply to the STP world as well. The only thing that changes is the notion of matrix factorization. So you don't do non-negative matrix factorization, but you do PSD factorizations then. But otherwise it's the same theory. And in fact, we will see later when we do reductions, we can use the same reduction mechanisms irrespective of the, of the paradigm that we are in. The only thing that changes are the approximation factors. All right, so how does this work? So now we, we, st we, we change our point of view, but rather than starting from a polytope, we now start from a, what I call an approximation problem. So an approximation problem is either a max or a min problem, and it cost, consists of three things. So I have feasible solutions of my problem, I have objective functions that I care for, let's say they are non-negative, and I have approximation guarantees that tell me how well I want to solve my problem with a linear programming formulation later, or here as an approximation problem. And I have some very basic requirements here. Obviously, my uh, approximation guarantee should be at least the true objective function value, because otherwise there's no point in even talking about approximations here. Good, so I'll give you an example. Let me give you an example of what this means. So for example, let's look at the vertex cover problem. So here I give you a graph G. And as all the feasible solutions, I consider all the vertex covers in my graph G. Right? These are just subsets of nodes covering all the edges. And let's say all my objective functions that I care for are all the non-negative weight vectors. So you solve the standard vertex cover type of problem. And um, now I have to define these guarantees. And I define these guarantees, F star, to be the true minimum. Okay? So in this case, my approximation is not an approximation. I want to solve the exact problem. If I would want to have, say, a factor 2 approximation, I put a 1 half in front of the minimum. And then I get a factor 2 approximation. And so on and so forth. Okay? So that's, that's uh, just an abstract view of looking at a combinatorial optimization problem. And what we're interested in is we want to talk about what does it mean 
for a linear program to solve such an approximation problem. And that I have to say now, and that will also define what the model is that we will be working with. So an IP formulation of such a problem P here is just a system AX less than or equal to B, with say X being in uh, RD, and now I need certain realizations. And what the realizations mean is, I have to somehow take my problem, which is a combinatorial problem, and bring it into a vector space, right? Because it doesn't live in a vector space. So the first thing that I require is that every S, or every one of my feasible solution, has to have a linear encoding. So the linear encoding is just denoted by x, of S here, x to the s here. And it has to satisfy a certain requirement. Namely, if I plug in these encodings here into my ax less than or equal to b, then I want that these inequalities are satisfied. Or put differently, what it means that this system ax less than or equal to b is a relaxation of the convex hull of my feasible solutions. Okay, so I want that my linear program at least contains the solutions that I care for once I have written them as vectors. Okay, and just to give you an idea what such an encoding could be, just think of the characteristic vectors of the tours or the edges in a graph. So this is one possible encoding, but it could be many, many other encodings, okay? And the second thing that I have to do, so this is for the solutions. Now I have to say what I do with the objective functions. So what I do is I take these functions f here, and for every function f, I pick an affine linear function wf. Because I have to linearize everything, I want to be in a polytope or like linear algebra setting. And what I require now is, I could, could pick many different linearizations, but what I require is that if I evaluate this linearization of f on this encoding x of s for s, then this better should be the actual evaluation of f of s. So you can pick any linearization that you want, as long as it's an exact linearization on the solutions s that I care for for my function f. Otherwise, you can do whatever you want. This S can, F can be super nonlinear, can be discontinuous, whatever you want, as long as when I linearize it, it has this property here. Okay? And that's fine. Right now, I have given you a way of turning uh, the problem into a linear program in some way, but I haven't said anything yet about the guarantee. So I have to say something about how well does this linear program solve my approximation problem. And that's the last thing. So you want this uh, linear program to achieve your approximation guarantee. What does it mean? It means that if you maximize out this linearization that you have for the function f over your feasible region, over the polytope, then this better should be at most f star. Okay? So it should be, at, like let's say we do a two approximation for a vertex cover, then you have the linear program of the actual convex hull and you have the LP relaxation, then you want that the value that you get is between the true convex hull, the true value, and at most a factor of two of, uh, of, of the true value, right? We want a two approximation. And, and for like more CS type of approximation, we can also do a CS or a kappa tau type of approximation here. Here we consider all the instances where, the, where, the, um, the, um, where we want that the value that the linear program returns is at most kappa whenever the true value was at most tau. That's like CS type. You want it to be at most C when the true value was at most S. Okay? So that's exactly the same type of notion. And in fact, it makes it much easier to work with uh, uh, reductions later. Mm -hmm. This picture, in a sense, you're, this is a relaxation. Yes. It's not saying that all the vertices correspond to real solutions. No, exactly. That's a relaxation. And that's what you want because if you build approximation algorithms typically, you compare the performance of the solution that you round to the LP optimal value. And that's why you need an integrality gap of a certain multiplicative factor. So, factor 2 for, TSP, uh, for vertex cover, for example. So, what you don't allow? You don't allow a to use uh, f in order to compute x, s, right? Correct. That's important. That's and that's important. So that's yes. The yes. And that is very important because you need the distributions. If you look at it from a distribution perspective, they need to be product. Yeah, otherwise, you know, the, of the PD for the Exactly. So exactly. That's a very important point. We come back to this later when we look at reductions as well. So it's very important. Yes, that is the that is a key. Uh, it's not. Uh, yeah, it is the only thing, but it's the key thing that makes the difference. So we have to say later what, what, we, what our computational resource is. Right? If you do a reduction in, polyno like in poly um, standard computations, I allow a polynomial whatever distortion. Right? My reduction can take polynomial time. I don't have a notion of polynomial time here. I have to tell you what the complexity notion is of executing the reduction. And there will be something equivalent to polynomial time computations. We get there in 10 minutes. All right, so that's the model that we want to work with. Why do you like this model? Because this model 
gets rid of this representation issue. You start from an approximation problem, you now get again a special matrix, but it's a combinatorial matrix. It's purely defined in terms of combinatorial terms. You measure the uh, distance of your approximation guarantee to the evaluation of the function at solution S. There's no geometry anymore here. And then you look for a slightly different factorization, which we call an LP factorization. That's a non-negative matrix factorization with one additional rank one factor. So the two only differ by a factor of plus minus one. So it's not important for complexity theoretic consideration, but it's very important for proving certain approximations. And the reason why you care is because you can prove a, a, a factorization theorem exactly in the same way as the polyhedral one, which states that if you have an approximation problem of that form here and you pick the slack matrix now, then the smallest possible linear programming formulation is exactly equal to the LP rank of the matrix M. And for, let's say, for all practical purposes, think of a LP rank as being the non-negative rank. Forget about the plus minus one. Okay? So now, if you know the original Yanakaki's factorization theorem, you know that you can read off the optimal linear program from the factorization. So you could ask here as well, what is the optimal linear program that you obtain if I give you such a factorization because I claim it's if and only if, right? It's e exactly equal. And it turns out that the optimal linear program is actually the trivial linear program. It's just a non-negative orthant, nothing else. Just x being non-negative, that's my linear program. But what happens now, all the magic goes into the encodings. So I pick a very special encoding here for my xs. Namely, I take these right factors here from the factorization to map a solution S to a linear encoding. And the left factor T here, I use to define my objective functions. Okay? So I have a trivial linear program, no constraints whatsoever except for non-negativity. And all the magic goes into picking the right encodings for the solutions S and the objective functions F. Okay? And why do you like it? Because you solve all the problems that we don't like. It's the representation independent. It's still independent of P versus NP. You can show it's the formal minimum over all extended formulations. If you arrange over all possible linear representations, not so important. It's, it's just a slightly more abstract model. And at the end of the day, because of the plus minus one thing, it's actually equivalent to the other model plus minus one. But you, of course, only know after the fact once you have proven the theorem that it's the same thing. Good. So now, what, what, what can we do with this? Let me first convince you, or give you a bit of an intuition what this optimal LP thing really means. So let's look at what happens. So you take your S, your solutions, and you construct a linear encoding of the solutions in space, X of S. And we take the convex hull of all these guys. That's what you care for. That's the object of interest. That's this convex hull here. And this thing lives in the non-negative authent. Why? Because it was a non-negative matrix factorization, and all the X, S are non-negative vectors. Okay, that's easy. What's my linear program? My linear program is just the non-negative orthant here. Okay, and now let's look at my objective functions. So my objective functions are built in this way as I've written here, right? W of f is some number that nobody cares for, another number that nobody cares for that's also just a number, and then I have this T here. This T is a non-negative matrix, and the X was also non-negative, but I have a minus in front. That means that both these red lines here point towards the zero. Okay? just by the way of how the functions will. They all point towards a zero. Now, if I optimize any of these functions over my non-negative orthant, what's the optimal solution? Well, it's a zero. It's the only vertex that I have, and it points towards the vertex. So all these functions are all simultaneously maximized at the zero. How is this possible? Well, just plug in zero here, and you see that you get the exact true objective function value that you want to have. It literally gives you the approximation guarantee that you claim to get. But the reason why this is possible is because we never talked about whether you want to be able to reconstruct a feasible solution or something. You only cared for approximating the objective function value. And that's what you get if you plug in the zero here for these functions. So you get the objective function value, but it's unclear how you can turn that zero that you get as a solution into anything meaningful in terms of the combinatorial solution to the original problem. And that's the same issue with like all types of approximation algorithms. You pick an encoding that allows you to round them in a nice way. Okay, so that's the intuition behind this. So this is really what happens. Uh, it turns out it has nothing to do with the linear program. It goes all into the encoding of the, of the solutions and the objective functions. Now let me talk a bit about how you can actually compute lower bounds for both of the, these models. What it all comes down to is we need to compute lower bounds for the non-negative rank of these matrices. And it doesn't really matter in which of the two models we do it because they're equivalent of uh, up to a plus minus one, okay? 
So how do we do this? Let me give you the very first or the most basic lower bonding technique uh, that was used in the beginning and that led to the, to the TSB result and it's a very simple type of idea. So you write your matrix S as a purported non-negative matrix factorization of say rank R here and that means that this you can write S as the sum of R, R non-negative rank 1 matrices. Right? So I can write it as R uh, non-negative matrices all of rank 1 and so on and so forth. So everything is not negative here, so what I can do is I can take the support of the matrix on the left side and on the right side. And what happens now is because this is a sum, everything was non negative, this becomes actually the union of the support of the rectangles here. These are rectangles, so it's an outer product of these vectors here. And what happens now is that whenever I have a non negative matrix factorization of size R, it induces a rectangle covering of my matrix of size R as well. Okay, and what this means is nothing else that the non-negative rank of a matrix M is lower, lower bonded by the so-called rectangle covering number of the matrix M, which is the smallest possible number of rectangles that you need to cover your matrix. Okay, so that's a very simple lower bonding technique. Why do we care? Because you can use this lower bonding technique to, to obtain uh, actually quite interesting results for linear programs. So let's say we start with the so-called correlation polytope. So what the correlation polytope is, is just the convex hull of all 0, 1 strings of length n and then you take this ring 1 matrix x, x, x transpose. So it's just a correlation polytope, it's equivalent to the cut polytope, it's a Boolean quadratic polytope, it's all the same thing. And why do you care for this polytope? Because this polytope models like for example CSPs and all types of things. And now what you can do is you can do some intelligent guessing and you realize that if you take any other 0, 1 string of length n then you can build this 1 minus 2 times the diagonal of x minus xx transpose comma bb transpose and if you do some very simple math you realize that this is always non-negative. Why do you care? Because now I have solutions, these are my vertices of my polytope because it's a convex hull and there's zero 1 vectors but I also have valid inequalities because these inequalities 1 greater than or equal to this term here is a valid inequality for my correlation polytope. So I have an exponential number of inequalities that I understand and I have an exponential number of vertices that I understand and that's great because now I can build a slack matrix from that or a partial slack matrix, it's a subset of the real slack matrix and I can write out the slack matrix or the partial slack matrix as mn here and I have x's in my rows and the b's in my columns and the entry of the matrix is 1 minus x transpose b squared. And what you then realize if you know a bit about communication complexity, well this polynomial, polynomial here is actually like if I only look at uh, uh, intersecting strings in exactly one coordinate and disjoint strings that's actually exactly the unique disjointness matrix as a submatrix here okay and then you say oh that's great because I know something about the unique disjointness matrix and then you involve a, a result by Rosborov that says that the rectangle covering number of the unique disjoint matrix is essentially exponential and then you're done. Why are you done? Because you have a very simple uh, chain of inequalities that you have something exponential which is equal to the rectangle covering number that lower bounds the non-negative ring, that's the lower bound of the slack matrix and that lower bounds your uh, linear programming complexity. So that's, that's all trivial, there's nothing deep here. This is the, the hard part, that is just observations. Right? So what you get is just from this rectangle covering number lower bound you get a lower bound on the size of any linear programming formulation of the correlation polytope. And once you have this, you can do some very simple reductions and you can show that the same thing holds for the stable set polytope and then you eventually get to the TSB polytope by encoding the stable set polytope into the TSB polytope. And you can go a bit further, you can look at hardness of approximations. So we had a first version where we generalized this Rusborov's type of technique uh, with communication complexity and later uh, Mark and Anker significantly improved this with information theoretic arguments and then we had a slightly different information theoretic version and what you get at the end of the day is if you take any LP formulation that approximates the correlation polytope with an effect of n to the 1 minus epsilon you need an exponential size linear program. Okay, so that's really in some sense also the best that you can hope for because as soon as you ask for an n approximation for the slack matrix that we have seen you can just take the cube without any constraints and it will give you a factor n approximation. So that's really the best that you can hope for. Alright, so that is uh, in terms of like show and, and optimizing of the uh, correlation polytope is NP hard. So that gives you the first polytope for which you cannot have small linear programming formulation and where it's NP hard to optimize over the polytope. Uh, and and um, now let me give you a different example which is the so-called matching problem. Uh, 
So here, the story changes significantly. So first of all, the proof is much harder. That's one thing. But uh, what Wordfuss was able to show is that if you take any LP formulation for the matching polytope, it has to be of exponential size. So that's very surprising, right? Because it immediately uh, answers a lot of questions and also raises many questions. So first of all, it's very special and important because matching, we know we can solve in polynomial time. Okay? We know how to do it. Uh, yet there's no small linear program. And um, in some sense, it separates the power of polynomial time computation from polynomial size linear programs. But it goes way beyond that because there is something that people refer to as the equivalence of optimization and separation, which means that if I can optimize in polynomial time, I can always separate in polynomial time and vice versa. But that means that if you give me a specific objective function that you care for, I can build a dynamic linear program that actually solves my problem. And it will be of polynomial time, uh, size. Why? Because I only make a polynomial number of iterations to solve the problem. And in every iteration, I create one hyperplane, so I get a polynomial size linear program. But that's for a specific objective function. So it's in some sense a question of being interactive versus non interactive. In the linear or in the extended formulation model, I need to write down the linear program and hand it to you. And I'm not allowed to touch the linear program anymore. It has to work for any of your objective functions that you care for. Say, so every weight vector that you want for the matching problem. However, in the other case, you tell me I want to solve the matching problem for that specific objective function. And for that specific objective function, I can give you a small linear program. So it's a question of like interactive versus non-interactive or adaptive versus non-adaptive. Uh, and I think uh, there's many questions arising from this type of uh, setting. Uh, then you can do a bit more with information theory. You can even show that you cannot approximate the matching problem well in an F test type of way, um, where you just like use the fact that information theory is smooth in some sense, so you can do small perturbations and everything works out. Uh, and that's interesting, right? Because matching is polynomial time solvable, hence you cannot even approximate this well with the small linear program. All right, so that's, that's uh, in terms of the matching polytope and the, um, um, the TSP polytope. And these were, in some sense, the, f the first and also, in some sense, the only explicit lower bounds that we have, where we literally looked at the slack matrix and did something for the slack matrix. What happened then is there was a shift to more reduction-like uh, approaches. And the first result in this vein was um, first in the linear case by Chen, Lee, Raghavendra, and Storia, and then for the SDP case later by Lee, Raghavendra, and Storia. And what they showed is a, a type of meta-theorem that says that if I give you a constraint satisfaction problem, a CSP, and you'd say you take the Lasser, or let's say you take the Shirali adams formulation of that problem, then any linear programming formulation that you can, or, or let's say I give you a small linear programming formulation, then, the, then you can derive a shirali adams formulation from it that has essentially the same size. Okay? And essentially there's a couple of factors involved, but it doesn't really matter. Which means that if I give you a small linear program, you can give me a small shirali adams formulation. But we know for many of the CSPs that there are no small shirali adams formulation, hence by contradiction you know that there cannot exist a small linear program. So that's how these arguments work. And what you get from this is you get in the very first iteration pretty weak lower bounds in terms of being super polynomial. They're roughly 2 to the log n by log log n. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, so this, you, you consider always like saying when you say I give you the linear program, is you're giving me all the hyperplane? Yes. So that I give you the, like, uh, the, the whole description of the linear program very succinctly, right? Yes. So the idea is it's, it's, like, a, it's a, like a meta type of argument. So if there would, would exist a small factorization, then I can massage this factorization to be of the shirali adams type. So shirali adams is just a different cone, right? I factor over the non-negative cone here. And shirali adams gives you a cone that is made up of all the k juntas for level k shirali adams. And then you can ask what happens if I want to factor over that cone. And what this argument shows, by random projections, you can turn these more complex functions into k juntas. So that's how the argument works. And, uh, and the same thing then for, uh, for some of squares proofs works for the, for the Lasser case. And what you get from this is that, like, for example, you cannot approximate max cut better than 1 half with a small linear program, and 3 set not better than 7 over 8. So now you can say, well, I don't like this lower bound. It looks very weak. Uh, there's been a very recent, very nice uh, result which actually shows that you can push that size lower bound significantly to be essentially sub-exponential, like close to exponential. Like you get very, very strong uh, lower bounds in terms of the size, so it's 2 to the n to the delta, roughly. So it's a very, very strong 
uh, terms of lower bounds. And the idea is that you don't take random projections, but you take a smarter form of projecting these uh, linear programming formulations and to construct Shirady Adams type of formulations from it. So that's how you should think about it. So it's not involved, but that's the spirit of the proof. And um, so that is all for this CSP setup. And then what, what you can do is you can go a bit further and you can define a true uh, reduction mechanism. So what I mean by this, I can give you a framework with which you can do reductions now between problems to establish hardness results. So let's maybe very briefly go back to how we do hardness reductions in, uh, in polynomial time computation. So how does it typically work? I have my favorite problem that I care for. And then I pick an MP hard problem Q. And then I somehow build a reduction map that embeds Q into P, and then I can use P to solve Q, and then hopefully I've shown, like if I show this, I know that P has to be uh, NP hard as well, right? That's how we do hardness reductions. And I have a couple of requirements. Typically my requirement is that my, 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 my reduction map itself has to be polynomial time computable, my numbers should be small, I should not have any blow-ups and things like this, right? That's what I need as a requirement to make this work. And um, yeah, so the intuition is, is really this embedding type of idea. And then you get a contradiction. If this would be easy, then this would be easy. But you know already this is hard, so it cannot be. OK, now you can say, can I do the same thing for extended formulations? So you again start out with a problem P. That's your favorite problem. And then I now pick an AP hard problem. An AP hard problem is a problem that, has, that admits no small linear programming formulation, say of polynomial size. And now what I want to do is I also want to construct a reduction that maps Q into P. And then I want to argue the same way as I do for reductions. But I need different requirements now. So polynomial time computability is a requirement because there is no notion of computation in the traditional sense. So I have, I have a, a couple of other requirements. So I have two requirements. One is that I need to map my solutions from Q to my solutions from P independently of each other. And we see in a second what this formally means. And similarly, I need to map my functions from Q to P without using anything about the S. So I need product distributions. That's the first thing. The other thing that I need is, if I execute this reduction function here, the very basic one that you can take is a linear one. But you can do much, much more complicated function. But now I need to somehow capture this notion of distortion that I lose a bit, right? In the, in the computational setup, you have a polynomial time reduction, and that burns polynomial computational time, and you have to account for this. Right? But you don't care because you want a super polynomial lower bound. So what's the right notion here? It turns out that you want that if you look at this reduction map as a map from solutions to solutions and functions to functions, that this map itself has a small non-negative rank. So I can factor this map the same way as how I factor my polytopes. It's just a matrix. And I want that this matrix has small non-negative rank and small in the sense of polynomial. Because that will, in some sense, lead in my reduction to a polynomial blow up, which I don't care for, because I want to have super polynomial lower bounds. So my notion of computational complexity shifts now from cycles, or like operations, to non-negative rank of the matrix. So I can do whatever I want, as long as this matrix, uh, this matrix of function f here has small non-negative rank. And that is my distortion mechanism. Sorry, I have, I have solutions to solutions, and linear functions uh, where's my, the, yes. Functions from Q, they are saying they can be any functions? So, you, yeah, so, so, the w, the w no, you can do whatever, so you can do whatever you want. So you need to give me two maps. One map that maps solutions to solutions, and then another map that maps functions to functions. But you cannot use anything about the solutions for the function map, so it has to be independent, and vice versa. So it has to be a product distribution if you look at it as distributions. That's what, why do you need this? Because these become matrices and you multiply the slack matrices with these matrices. And you don't want to lower the non-negative rank. And how do you not lower the non-negative rank? By requiring them to be independent. Okay? That's the easiest version. Now you can say, okay, maybe I want some correlation, a, a small amount of correlation between them. But what does small amount of correlation mean here? It means that the, if you factor this matrix, it has to have low non-negative rank. Because that means you have low correlation. And then, yes, they can depend on each other in a certain way, so you get gap amplification type of arguments, but only in a very small, uh, like, well-controlled way. Okay? So the intuition is exactly the same one as you would have in computational complexity. And what can you do with it? You can do actually a couple of very interesting things with this now. So the first thing that you can now do is, you can look at the vertex cover problem. And so we know vertex cover, we have no idea how hard it really is, right? That depends whether we assume unique games conjecture or not, and so on and so forth. There's a couple of specialized PCPs uh, to get uh, stronger lower bounds. 
But now something very interesting happens. So for linear programs, the unique games conjecture is true. What does it mean? It means if you want to solve, say, the, label, uh, the, the labeling problem with a linear program where you want to just differentiate between epsilon 1 minus epsilon, you need a super polynomial sized linear program to do this. But that means that the unique games conjecture, like if you take the, the labeling version, is unconditionally hard for linear programs. It's great, right? Because now you have a new hard problem that you did not have beforehand. And so what you do now is you, you take the unique games conjecture. The problem is that the, the maps are nonlinear and they're highly nonlinear, so you have to be very careful. So what you do now is you transform this, uh, you take the Bunsen code verifier for the unique games conjecture, or for the unique games, and you turn this into a CSP. And it becomes a very special CSP. It becomes so-called one free bit CSPs where you have one free bit in the, in the solution. So you have always two symmetric solutions for every constraint. That's how you should think about this. And then I have a CSP and then I can apply this uh, Chen, Lee, Raga, Vendor and Steuer framework to get a Laoban for this specific CSP. And I can show that this CSP is hard to approximate for a lin linear program uh, with completeness 1 minus epsilon and soundness epsilon. And why is this great? Because that's exactly what I need for a reduction from a CSP to vertex cover to get an inapproximability factor of 2 minus epsilon. Okay, and then you just take that CSP and you take a just very simple reduction, the one that you would do for max cat to vertex cover, you take exactly the same reduction now to get a 2 minus epsilon inapproximability for vertex cover from these one free bit CSPs. Right, so think of the one free bit CSPs as, as, as a stronger version of max cut. So for every epsilon that you want to have in soundness, I can construct an alphabet with like, you, like a k-area alphabet, such that if I look at these one free bit CSP instances, they have no small c uh, linear programming formulations for the epsilon soundness versus one minus epsilon completeness. And then the, the, the reduction is very straightforward. Now, once you, I mean, we all know, once you have the vertex cover one, you can go to the complement, you get independent set. So and what you typically do is, if you look at all the proofs, if you do it the standard way, you just get that um, the stable set problem cannot be approximated within any constant factor. Okay? And then what people do, they take all types of graph products and powering and gap amplification type of techniques, and then you suddenly can show that, vert, uh, that the stable set problem cannot be approximated within a factor of n to the 1 minus epsilon. Okay, and I don't get this here. So the best thing that you can do is within uh, no constant factor. And now you can wonder wh what's going on here. So maybe it's just that I cannot do gap amplification and that's why I cannot do this. It turns out it's much, much more complicated. Namely, you know that if by the PCP theorem, you cannot do better than n to the 1 minus epsilon for stable set. Okay, that we know. And, but there exists a linear program of linear size. So it's really small that gives you a root n approximation for the stable set problem. So that means that, the, that this result cannot hold for linear programs. It's not just that we don't know how to prove it, but it cannot hold. So how is this possible? Well, this is possible because the linear program, we never talked about how hard it is to write it down. We only talked about that it has to have polynomial size. And so what I do now is you give me your graph, and I need to solve the weighted stable set problem over this graph. So I do some pre-processing. I color the graph in a very smart way, and that allows me to con construct a, a root n many special color classes. And then I can use these color classes to write down a small LP of linear size. And then whenever you give me any objective function, I can approximate the stable set problem for that objective function with an effector of root n, which is much better than n to the 1 minus epsilon, obviously. But that means that there is a difference between LPs and polynomial time computation also in the other direction. Because suddenly you can do something that you know is NP-hard, you can do with a small linear program, in principle. Uh, you don't know how to write it down, but in principle you can do this. And since we only care of the, for the notion of size, this really means that linear programming is very different than polynomial time computations, because pre-processing is perfectly fine in the linear programming world. Okay. Good, so what else can you do with the reduction? So you can, you can do many, many things with the reduction. I just want to give you a bit of an idea what the flavor of results are. So you have more or less three base hard problems that you care for um, that are really interesting. Uh, the first one is max cut that gives you one half plus epsilon. Then you have unique games that you cannot do within any constant factor, like for any like, uh, soundness completeness pair. And then you have the, the matching problem. Uh, because you also know that this uh, needs a hard uh, linear program. So from the first one you get very simple type of CSP results. You know that for 3 set you can do better than 7 a over 8. Uh, for 2 set you get 3 over 4 which matches uh, Michel Goman's and I think William's approximation uh, uh, LP. And um, 
You can also show that for matching with the same reduction mechanism, even for bonded degree matching, so we know that matching is e easy in many cases. So matching is easy in planar graphs, matching is easy for bonded tree width, and so on and so forth. We have small LPs. So you could ask, well, maybe the issue is the, 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 the sparsity or the, the degree of the vertices. And what you can show with this very simple reduction, even if you reduce the out degree of every node to at most degree 3, then still you effectively cannot approximate matching with the now 1 plus epsilon over n squared. And what you do is reduce the normal hardness result to a, a degree, three, uh, degree 3 graph, and what you do is replace every vertex by, a, by an odd cycle of lens uh, C, to, uh, C of uh, n to the uh, n minus 1 where n is the number of nodes and then you get this opt cycle there and then you can get the same result. Uh, you can do many many more things, you can show hardness for sparse uh, cut for like bond the tree width on the supply graph uh, from unique games you can um, get this one free bit CSPs or Q free bit CSPs with an uh, any constant factor. What is a bit ugly about this, at least in the first iteration was that you need to first go through this Shirati Adams mechanics to get these hard CSPs and then from the hard CSPs you can go to all types of other problems here. But what you can also do is once you have these stronger reductions where you allow for this uh, um, polynomial overhead in the non-negative rank, you can actually do something like a weak form of gap amplification and you can directly show with a reduction, a much stronger reduction now from unique games that these were one, uh, one free bit CSPs or Q free bit CSPs are hard and then you get many many more of the results just by using standard type of reductions from there and um, that's how the linear world looks right now like what we know in, in terms of uh, results. Now let me spend the last uh, maybe five minutes to talk a bit about STPs. So STPs are significantly less well understood and the reason for this in my opinion is uh, for two reasons. So the first one is that we have a lot of lower bonding techniques for the non-negative rank and the reason for this is because the non-negative rank is atomic. What this means is that the a rank R non-negative, like a matrix that has non-negative rank R is you can write as R copies of rank 1 matrices. That is not true for the PSD rank anymore. There's no such decomposition notion and we have no direct lower bounding technique for the PSD rank and that's why we have virtually only very very few results uh, for, for the STP setup. Um, and, it, and, it's, and it's also because STPs at the same time are also much much stronger than linear programs. So in some sense linear programs are very weak compared to STPs. So for example what you can show is the first thing is you can separate linear programs from STP. So you can show that there exists a spectrohedron that's, a, that's an STP of like polynomial dimension and squared. And that's, I mean, it's obviously small, it's like polynomial. However, whenever you want to take an IP that approximates this spectrohedron within a factor of n to the 1 minus epsilon, which is a really bad factor, it has to be of exponential size. So there exists really an STP that is much, 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 much stronger than a linear program. And that really captures a lot of the hardness that we see. Then also it goes further, you know from approximation that with, a, with no polynomial size linear program you can do better than one half for max cut. But we know that there's Goman Williams that gives you a 0.87 with a very very simple, almost trivial STP. Of course you have to round afterwards and that's non-trivial but the STP itself is a very very simple STP, right? And last but not least of course we have a Mihaly's uh, stable set result that has uh, driven a couple of people crazy which is basically if you take the stable set polytope over perfect graphs you know that the standard appear relaxation, the most basic one that you can come up with is a perfect relaxation. It gives you the convex hull of the, of the solutions. However, there's no polynomial size LP known for that. The only the best one that we know is quasi-polynomial with n to the log n. And that's like, that comes down to the click versus independent set type of uh, problem. That's exactly what you have to decide here. Good, but not all is lost. You can show some things for the STP case. So the first thing that you can do, of course, is you can start counting again. So and you can take the counting argument that Rustforce has for the linear case and then you need to do a couple of things because the problem now is you have to rescale things in a, in a smart way so it's not completely straightforward, you have to do some rescaling here but once you have this done you can show that in the same way as before there have to exist certain Z1 polytopes that have no small STP formulation but again this is only an existential statement, it, it, it means nothing you know almost all of the polytopes have high extension complexity for STPs but you have no idea which one it is 
And um, then the first real lower bound in terms of given an explicit one was Lee, Raghavendra and Steurer and they call, called this back then quantum learning. I think by now they have changed the name. It's just matrix multiplicative weights what's happening here. And it's the same idea as before. You start from, a, uh, from you assume that there is a small in, uh, STP formulation and then you do some mat matrix multiplicative weights or quantum learning and you learn a smaller SER formulation and then you know this one cannot exist because we have lower bounds so the small STP formulation cannot exist. So it's the same type of argument. Uh, what is very sad about this is it doesn't give you any idea of how you really want to lower bound the STP rank of a matrix or the PSD rank. It only tells you by contradiction that it cannot happen but it's not that you can extract a lower bounding technique for the PSD rank from this uh, uh, argument. And then what you can do is if you again go back to symmetric STPs, uh, you can show that matching has no small symmetric STPs. It's effectively generalization of, uh, of Yanakakis argument. And you can also show that if you look at the TSB problem, um, then um, K levels of Lasser are effectively the optimal formulation among all of size n to the K, roughly speaking. But that's, that's it. There's no other uh, lower bounding technique known for the STP case. You can do a bit again with reduction. So this reduction mechanism that I mentioned earlier is completely agnostic to the paradigm that you're working in. So it doesn't matter if you do AP extended formulations, STP extended formulations or any other cone. This framework is completely independent of the, of the cone that you work over. So you can reuse the same reductions and then you can show a couple of uh, uh, interesting results. So for example you can take the Lasser gap instances for this max 3x or where the right hand sides are forced to be zero and you know that there's a, like a 2 minus epsilon hardness there in terms of uh, gap then you can turn this into an unconditional hardness using this, this uh, Lasser, uh, uh, Lee, Raghavendra and Steyer result and from this you can show that max cut cannot be approximated now by, uh, by an STP with an effector of 15 over 16 which is better than the 16 over 17 that we usually have and it closes the gap between Goman Williams and max cut uh, a bit more. Uh, you can also then again you can use max cut to further reduce it and you get hardness taking the same reductions as before for sparse cut for ver various versions. You can get seven, uh, 7 over 6 for vertex cover in unconditionally for STPs and so on and so forth. And because the mechanism doesn't really care about the cone that you work over you can even do this within Lasser. So you can show within Lasser, you can use this as a reduction mechanism and you can take this max KCSB uh, result from a few years back and then you get that if you take Lasser uh, relaxations or formulations for the independent set problem then even after n to the gamma, gamma many rounds you still have a gap of at least n to the 1 minus gamma. And that shows that Lasser is also exponentially weaker than linear programs because you have this small linear program of linear size that gives you a root n approximation. So there's even a huge gap between Lasser in the non-CSP case and linear programming formulations versus in the CSP case Lasser is the best that you can hope for. Okay, that separates these two out in a, in a very natural way uh, as well. Alright, let me maybe close with a few open uh, questions or problems that I think is what somewhat, somewhat summarizes what people are interested in uh, those days. Um, the first thing of course is people care for the extension complexity or formulation complexity for the matching problem. It's really hard because we have no idea how to do lower bounds. We just don't know any technique that we can use. And you don't try to go from Lasser here, it's not going to fly because it works nicely if you have a CSP because in a CSP you have no other constraint and every zero one point is a feasible solution and you only want to maximize the value of the CSP. Versus in the matching problem you have many many different constraints that come in and that make the structure of the, of the sum of squares certificates that you want to get much, much more complicated. So maybe there's a way, but it looks extremely, m much more non-trivial than in the CSP case, which is already non-trivial. Um, so that leads then to the second question, can you give me lower bonding techniques for STPs in general? Um, there's a whole class of problems that we know are hard to approximate, so for example TSP and computational complexity, but we have no way of how to show this for the LP case. And the reason for this is that these hardness reductions here that people used actually make the functions that you reduce depend on the solutions and vice versa. So these are not product reductions in some sense. So you cannot use them in that same framework and you have to do something much smarter. And we tried for quite a while to make them independent and, and we didn't find a way of uh, how to do it. Uh, what people now started to look at uh, that goes a bit uh, back to Mark's initial question is looking at extension complexity over alternative cones. 
So there's one extremely promising cone out there, that's the hyperbolic uh, cone or hyperbolic programming that's still polynomial time solvable, but the key thing now is I can tune my cone to the problem that I care for. Okay, beforehand I have a polytope or a problem that I care for and I just take the non-negative author and or the, the PSD cone. But now I can pick a hyperbolic polynomial that I can pick as a function of what I really want to solve. So I have much, much more freedom here. And the hope is that maybe with hyperbolic programming you can capture the matching problem with a small polynomial size formulation. Uh, the other question on the other extreme end, what people are looking at those days is uh, co-positive programming. It's known to be NP-hard, but it's not known to capture all problems of interest. So you know that you can get small extended formulations for all um, a zero one polytopes, let's say, as long as the vertices can be recognized efficiently by a circuit, then you can get a small co-positive programming formulation, but you don't know whether this is true for a general zero one polytope, so that's a wide open as well. And then last but not least, there's a whole industry right now trying to understand what the difference between these hierarchies and these general formulations are. So you know in the CSP case they are more or less equivalent, right, and what this comes down to is like you can think of these hierarchies as being generatable by a computer program, so that's a uniform model of computation, right? Versus these general uh, extended formulations here are non-uniform because I can do a non-deterministic guess, I just need to make sure that they exist but I don't care where they come from. So when people try to understand what this really means and like for example for stable set, we know it's very different, we know that for CSPs it's identical and people try to understand where the, where the boundary between these two notions of complexity is. All right. That's all that I wanted to say. Thank you very much.